Okay, so right now, I want you to give a great uh, round of applause to the Lord as Pastor Starla Darnell comes to speak to us this morning. Amen. Good morning. This is such a warm church and congregation of people. Um, I don't say that everywhere I go or everywhere I speak, but I feel like I'm, I'm at home here. And over the last 15 years, for some reason, the McDaniel family has bumped into me over and over and over for the last 15 years, and this is the pinnacle of that. So a long time ago, I met your pastor. I was the worship leader at the Riverwalk Church of God. And which was the Sanford Church of God, right? Years and years and years ago. And even before that, I sang in the Voices of Lee, and I came to this church and sang. So it's been a long time, but I'm back. So um, Pastor Todd told you that me and my husband pastor the Alive Church in Pooler, Georgia. And we have three beautiful, beautiful children. I think I have a picture of them. Can you show everybody my kids? Those are my babies. I thought it was fitting to show you my babies today since I'm talking about pregnancy care and babies and children. And they're the most wonderful thing I've ever done with my entire life. The, my greatest accomplishments are right there. I have Judah Scott in the middle, Jedediah Parker on the left, and Esther Victory on the right. Those are my babies. I'm really concerned with what names mean. And Judah means praise God, obviously. Jedediah means... Um, beloved of God, and Esther means star, which is very fitting because my name is Starla. So she's my little star. My whole life, I have been obsessed with the story of the Bible, and the story is, anybody guess? Come on, y'all. There you go. Am I in a Pentecostal church? Okay, <laughs> I need to hear people talk to me this morning. I've been obsessed with the story of Esther my whole life, and I did not learn till I was an adult that the name Esther means star, so I think it's very fitting, and today I will eventually get to telling you that story. So my idea today in coming to speak to you is pray, seek, and be bold. Three steps, Okay. So, Pastor Todd has been talking to you about love being the answer. I truly believe that. Love is the answer. Love can be a noun or a verb, but I like it, like it in its verb tense. You have to do something. Love is an action, right? And um, it is my goal in life to call the body of Christ to action. I think for far too long the body of Christ have sat in the pews and we love the Lord and we pray and we hang out with each other, but past that, there's not much action, right? Jesus was full of action, right? The whole Bible, the whole New Testament is full of action of Jesus and all his actions, all the disciples and the things they did. Read the stories of Paul. It is amazing. And if our lives should um, mirror that of Jesus's, if we should walk in his ways, then our lives should be full of action action, action in love and care for our community and for the believer and non-believer, right? So today, this brings me to my text, and I think they're going to put it up there, but if you still carry a Bible with you, do you still carry, anybody still carry a Bible? Look at that. Look at y'all. I am so proud of y'all. Um, my Bible is my tablet these days, but I still like to buy Bibles. My husband gets on to me. I buy Bibles, and they're all, like, stacked because I like to collect them, but I use my phone most of the time. All righty. So my text comes from Acts 4 and 31. So we know what happens in Acts, right? I don't want to take anything for granted when I, I ask you these questions because recently I went to a Christian high school. I will not reveal the name, so don't ask, don't ask me. I went to a Christian high school in Savannah, and I asked a class of seniors at a Christian high school, how many knew the story of Esther? Do you know how many raised their hand? Zero. 
Zero raised their hand. So I will not take for granted ever in any crowd or audience who knows what. So let me give you some background here. In Acts, that's when we see the Holy Spirit coming, right? Jesus is gone. The Holy Spirit comes, okay? So we're, um, they've been practicing the, the gifts for a while. They've been going out and praying for people, and they've been, been healed. And now we are at Acts 4, and the disciples and all the people who gathered are praying for courage. And why are they praying for courage? They're praying for courage because they went out and they started healing people and people were like, whoa, this is not okay. It was dangerous, right? In that time and age, they were like, what's going on here? These people are practicing witchcraft or whatever. So they gathered together and they prayed for courage. And at the end of their prayer, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. So there it is. They prayed, they sought the Holy Spirit, and God gave them boldness. One of the reasons we have the Holy Spirit is for boldness, right? So I feel like a church of Pentecostal people should be really bold if we are practicing in the Holy Spirit and we are being filled with the Holy Spirit. So um, this brings me to my favorite story, okay? So I'm going to tell you today the story of Esther. And I'm going to tell it to you in a way that I tell my little Esther, the story of Esther, because it helps us realize that Esther was a real person. It was a true story. I'm going to take it out of its biblical wording for just a minute. And I'm going to start at the beginning. And if you would like to follow along in your Bible, you can. But it's going to be in my own words. So, here we go. There was a little girl in the Bible named Myrtle. Does anybody know anyone named Myrtle here? Y'all know a Myrtle? Anyone? No one knows. You know a Myrtle? Man, I don't want to say it now. I feel like Myrtle is the name of somebody who's not very attractive, right? That's terrible. I probably shouldn't say that. Someone could say that about my name. It's, you know, everybody has their own thing. But Myrtle doesn't sound like a name that is attractive. Actually, her name was Hadassah. But Hadassah means by the Myrtle. Hadassah is a name these days. Have y'all heard of people naming their kids Hadassah lately? You haven't? I have. I have a couple friends with Hadassahs. Um, my best, one of my best friends, I have a girl named Esther Victory, and they named their little girl Hadassah Jubilee. I'm like, it's kind of the same name, you know, just different. Anyway, so there's this little girl named Myrtle. Myrtle was an orphan. Her family was killed in war, and she lived with her cousin who adopted her. She was a refugee and an orphan. Doesn't sound like she has a whole lot of opportunity in life, right? Not only was she a refugee and an orphan, she was part of a body, part of a race of people who were um, downtrodden. They were looked down upon. They were not Persians. They were living in exile in the land of Persia. And so she was living with her cousin, and um, there was this king in Persia at the time, and his name was Xerxes. So Xerxes was this big and mighty ruler, and he was power hungry and thirsty. And after one of his conquests, he decided, I'm going to have a um, banquet, and we are going to celebrate this conquest. So he has this banquet. He invites his queen Vashti, and Queen Vashti says, no. It embarrasses the king, and so he puts out this um, law to all the men in the land saying that, hey, you guys are the rulers of your household. If you tell your wives they have to do something, they have to do it. That would not fly. <laughs> that would not fly these days, right? So we can already see in this time that women were looked, as second, looked at as second-class citizens, so next, he asks Vashti to come again, and she doesn't, and he, he gets frustrated, and so now he's got to do something else. So he says, okay, I'm done with you, Vashti. I'm going to find a new wife. So he sends out agents into all the land of Persia, and these agents are told to go to all the land and find the most beautiful girls. Mordecai, a Jewish man, knew how beautiful his cousin was. And he said, when these guys come, they're going to take you. And we cannot let you go with this name, Hadassah. And you can never tell anyone that you are a Jew. 
So he gave her a new name. He gave her the name Esther, meaning star, because that's exactly what she was. She was a star. And in the time, she didn't know it yet because she was a refugee, an orphan, and a minority. But God had a plan for her, and Mordecai knew it. So he took Esther now, and he gave her to the agent, and she went to the palace. In the palace, there were hundreds, maybe thousands, we don't know, girls there for the king to choose from. And he could choose from any one of these girls, and they would go through three years of beauty treatments. How many women would love that? Sometimes I wish that, uh, I tell my husband, I need like a whole extra budget just for like all my beauty stuff, because I really enjoy it, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so she got three years of beauty treatments, and she went to the king, and she found favor with his eunuch that knew him very well. And so that eunuch told her to do certain things and take certain things, and she did those things, and she went to the king, and it says that King, king Xerxes loved her. That's a big deal. In these times... Their love wasn't a, it didn't have to happen. Kings could ha have as many women as they wanted to, and love had nothing to do with a lot of it. He had an extra harem, a second harem, it says, for all the women that he had. But Esther was special. God gave her favor. The little star, the little orphan, refugee, minority girl was now in the palace with the king, and he had given her favor so much that not only did the king choose her, but it says he loved her. So Esther was now the queen. This little Jewish girl was the queen of all Persia. She was undercover still because her cousin Mordecai told her to never tell anybody who she was. So she didn't. She stayed in the palace and did what she was told. So one day, there's lots more in there, but one day it has so happens that this man, this terrible man named Haman, decides that he does not like the Jewish people. Mordecai actually made him frustrated, and there was some other stuff in there. He wouldn't bow down to him. So Haman went to the king and said, I want to exterminate these terrible people of the Jews. And for some reason, the king was like, oh, sounds good. Here you go. Here's my ring. This is the times they live in, y'all. It is brutal. It is a brutal time when you can go to your king and say, hey, they, these Jews are getting on my nerves. And he says, yeah, get rid of them. Here's my ring. And that's what happened. He put out a verdict to, to all the land saying that, you know, as of this date, we're going to exterminate the Jews. So Esther heard through her cousin Mordecai that this was going to happen. And what did she do? Does anybody know what Esther's next step was? She prayed and she sought God. Not only did Esther pray, she called her entire people to pray with her. For three days they fasted. Nothing, no food or drink entered their body for three days. This is also an extreme measure because the body can only go three days without water. This was serious for her. Her people were about to be exterminated while she sat on her high, pretty crown in the palace. And so she prayed. She called all of her servants to pray with her and fast with her. She called all the Jewish people to pray and fast with her, and they all did. So for three days, she did that. At the end of the three days, it doesn't say that there was an angel from the Lord that showed up or something miraculous happened. None of that happened that we know of. There was no sign or sparkles or anything. At the, at the end of those three days, she had prayed and sought the Lord. It was now time to be bold. So she decided at that time that she would go to King Xerxes. So Esther walked to King Xerxes. I'm sure she was scared to death because I would be. Because as we talked about before, women were second-class citizens. And in this culture where you can mark off a whole race of people just by a stamp of a ring. If the king did not lift his scepter in approval of Esther, she would have died. This was a big deal. How many people would be nervous? How many people would be completely scared? How many of you would just decide, use somebody else, Lord? You know? 
In my life, I have learned something about the will of God. It's almost always scary. That cannot be what determines what is the will of God, because there are a lot of things that are scary. But that there's some things that you just know, like, I'm supposed to do this, but it scares me so much, so I'm just going to sit here and pretend like it didn't happen. I'm going to pretend like the Lord didn't tell me that. Because nobody really knows but me and him, right? So Esther chose in that moment, she said, I've got to do it. Mordecai told her, you have to do it. There's no one else that can do it. There's no one else in your position. So she did it. She went to the king, he lifted his scepter. And not only did he accept her, he looked at her and said, Esther, what is it that you want? I'll give you everything up to half of my kingdom. How many of you would have said, all right, give me half your kingdom. (laughs) And just turned around and walked out of there. Some of us might, but Esther didn't. She looked at the king and she said, I only want one thing from you. I just want you to come to dinner with me and bring your friend Haman. I don't know what her purpose in this was, but I think she was trying to wine and dine the king. I think she was trying to soften him up a little bit so that she could eventually tell him what her real reason was for talking to him. So he came and she wine and dined him and Haman. They had a banquet. And at the end of the night, he looked at her and he said, okay, Esther, What is it that you want? I'll give you anything up to half of my kingdom. He offered it to her again. And she looked at him and said, all I want to do is have dinner with you one more night. And he said, okay. So the next night, him and Haman came, and they had a dinner. And at the end of that night, he looked at her, and he said, okay, Esther, enough of the wine and dining, enough of the banquets, enough of all of these games. What is it that you want from me? And that's when she spilled the beans After she had won the favor of the king, after she had he had fallen in love with her, after she had softened softened him up with food and drink, she looked at him and said, "That evil man Haman is trying to kill all of my people and me, the queen." At that point, the king looked at him and had him killed, just like that, done, over with. But God gave Esther. He gave her the favor to do it. Sometimes I look at my own life, and I look at the lives of others, and I see the positions that God has put them in. He has all given us a place, a gift, a time. He's all given us a reason to be here. It says in our mother's womb, we were knit together. In Jeremiah, it says that you called me even before the foundations of the earth, right? So we all have a purpose. If we all have this wonderful, great purpose, then why are we silent? Why do we take this beautiful gift that God has given us of love, this beautiful gift of salvation, this beautiful gift of restoration, and we sit on it? It's just like Esther going and going to the king and him saying, I'll give you up to half my kingdom, and she's like, taking it. She could have taken the kingdom and not done the hard thing. Jesus could have came to earth and lived like he did and not done the hard thing. Even the night before he went to get on the cross, he begged, take, let this cup pass from me. It was hard, but because he did it, Because his love pushed him to action, because his love pushed him so far as to give his life, not just one or two people are saved, but anyone who accepts him is saved. Anyone who accepts accepts him is affected by that pure blood, the sacrifice of Jesus. And you know, when he left this earth, he said, and you will do even greater things. He looked down and said, all of you people, everybody who accepts me will do even greater things. So why are we not doing them? I think it's part of the devil's ploy and plan to cripple us in our fear. Um, The other day while I was talking to my son, and I see us as parents, you see things in your kids, right? We see. Through spiritual eyes, I see things in my own kids. And in Judah, my oldest one, I see something that he's supposed to do. I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, but he's terrified of it already. 
And so right now I tell them, fear is from the devil. Fear is not of the Lord, Judah. If you're scared of it, you do it anyways. Because fear can cripple us into not embracing the reason that God put us on this earth. In the New Testament, it talks about everyone being a different part, an eye, an ear, a mouth, a hand, a foot. What would happen if the body of Christ actually worked together? What could we do? In this day, in the culture that we live, media and social media and all the things in the airways affect culture more than the Christian body does. We are a large force. This is only one body in Savannah, Georgia. There are hundreds of others here in this city and across the nation that if we came together and locked arms, that we could change this world. That is what God put us on this planet to do. And so, today, I ask you, to stand up and come to action. But before you do that, pray. Seek God and be bold. It's going to be scary. It's scary every time I do something that God's called me to. Every single time it's scary. But I'm never regretful of it. There are people in history, well-loved people in history, and we know their names. Names are important to me. But why do we know their names? We know their names because they were bold. Martin Luther King was bold. Rosa Parks was bold. Harriet Tubman was bold. Frederick Douglass was bold. Abraham Lincoln was bold. All of them had part in ending segregation and slavery. I'm sure it was scary for all of them in a time where it was looked down upon, but they stood up and did something. Alice Paul, Carrie Chapman, um, Kat and Lucy Burns were the women who stood up for women's suffrage. Nobody knows much about these women, but I just studied about them. These women were locked up and force-fed because they just wanted to vote. That's it. What if they had never done that? I might not be here today. I might not be able to stand on this stage today. You know? It's so true. Then we have Corey Timboom. What if she had not done what she did, being a safe haven for Jews trying to get away from the Holocaust? What about Jesus, Paul, and the disciples? What about Moses, Abraham, Esther, every person that we look at throughout history who changed the world were bold? You have to stop caring what people think and start caring what God thinks. Because in the end, those people who you cared about so much about what they thought of you, they're not going to be there. The one who is going to be there is Christ. So today, in a world with such confusion and complacency, we as believers need to rise up and take action. Um, this whole series of love is the answer. Pastor Todd told me about it uh, this week sometime. I was talking to him on the phone. I've just been thinking about it. It is the answer. I mean, you can't even like, you can't even say it's not. There's no way you can come about it and say that love is not the answer. Love is the answer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was the answer. His love was the answer for us. But did you know that in this country that we live in, the great United States of America, we have legalized murder? And not only is it legalized murder, it's happening in our city. On 34th Street in Savannah, Georgia, there is an abortion clinic where it is legal to murder babies every day. It's normal. People drive in and drive out. Drive in and drive out all day. Throughout the week, they offer the RE486 pill. And then on Thursdays and Fridays, they do surgical abortions in a little clinic that is so deceivingly called Savannah Medical Clinic. But the only thing they do there is abortions. 
Someone told me that that clinic has been there since the 70s, and there are people who have lived in Savannah their whole life and didn't even know it. I want to give you some statistics on um, abortion, if you don't mind. An estimated 59.1 million babies in the U.S. have been aborted since 1973, the decision of Roe versus Wade. An approximate 21% of all U.S. pregnancies end in abortion. 58% of all women having abortions are in their 20s. Black, non-Hispanic women have the highest abortion ratio. Black women's abortion ratio has reached 444 abortions per 1,000 live births. This is genocide. According to the Gutmatcher Institute, women who obtain abortions are predominantly poor or low income in their 20s and unmarried. Black women and Hispanic women continue to be dispor dis disproportionately represented among abortion patients. More than 7 in 10 U.S. women obtaining an abortion report a religious affiliation. I know this to be true from working at the Savannah Care Center. There's been many days where I sit in rooms and counsel with girls who attend churches all across Savannah because there is a little question that they fill out when they walk in there to talk to me. And it says, are you a believer? Where do you attend church? And many times I see churches that I know. I see um, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, churches of God, independent churches, Catholic churches all day long. 37% of women who report their religion are having abortions. Protestant. That's us, guys. That is us. And I feel like sometime in our history, and I don't know this to be true, but this is where my mind has played, that we've looked down on it so much that they don't want to disappoint us. They don't want to disappoint their parents. They don't want to disappoint anybody. But I'll tell you what happened to my sister. My oldest sister became pregnant out of wedlock at 19 years old. My parents were strict, church of God folk. My sister comes home and tells my parents, and you know what my dad did? He hugged her and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> what else are you going to do? God's created a life, and that life is precious. And that has stuck with me my whole life, how my dad reacted. He took her into his arms, he hugged her, and he said, I'm so excited. I can't wait. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we not judge? Can we look at somebody and be Christ to them and wrap our arms around them and say, this is going to be okay. I'm going to walk with you through this. The statistic of um, abortions right now is one in four women in America have had an abortion. That means in this congregation, there are probably women who have had abortions and never told anybody. And that's okay. It is okay. I am not here to condemn you. I'm not here to give you a hate speech. This is my speech of love. And my speech of love is this. This body of believers loves you. I can truly feel that. I have talked with your pastors and their pastoral staff. I came in here one day just to introduce myself, and you know who I saw? Pastor Walt. I sat with Pastor Walt for about 10, 15 minutes, and we talked about his heart and the pastor staff's heart here to embrace women and families going through crisis pregnancy. It's not just women. I have... Families come in sometimes. I have young men and women who are together, unwed or wed, coming in not knowing what to do because they cannot support a child on their own. They need community. And you know what the church is? Community. God set it up this way to take in the lost, to take in the brokenhearted, not just to be a social club but to be a club of people who love God and love others. 
so the Savannah Care Center is on 34th Street. And I wanted to say this today. The Savannah Care Center always needs everything. It's a nonprofit organization, and they wholeheartedly rely on donations from people and volunteering. If you have it in your heart, in your capacity to volunteer, then call the center. We're faith-based. We do free pregnancy tests, free limited ultrasounds. We do parenting classes. We talk with them about decision-making. We give free baby items, and we give resources and referrals. If we don't have it, we find somewhere who has it. Because our goal is to restore this family, restore the woman, and restore the child. Save the baby. Save the mother. The care center also is Um, We take monetary donations. We take volunteers. If you have time, if you have, our volunteer staff right now are 60 and 70 years old. We have a couple younger ones. But if you're retired and you're sitting at home and you don't know what to do, I have something for you to do. (laughs) They're our best volunteers. Because sometimes if you've lived through some stuff on your own, it's easier for you to help somebody through that stuff. So today, if this be your cause, if something I've said has sparked your heart or your mind, then I would ask you today to pray, seek God, and ask Him for the boldness to step up and do something about it. I'm not an activist. I'm not going to stand in front of a place with a sign and protest, but I am going to pray. I'm going to take people in who need it, and I'm going to love them. And I know this body of believers will do that too. So today, can we pray together? Dear God, I thank you so much for the sanctuary church. Dear Father, I pray that you'll begin to speak to these people's hearts today, dear God, that you will raise up a generation of Esthers that will stand in the gap for their people who are being killed daily just down the road from here, dear Father. I pray, dear God, that you will um, begin to speak um, to their hearts about things to do, where to go, what to say, ministries to build, dear Father, that you will give this body a new compassion for mothers, orphans, and children, dear God, who need a home, dear God. I pray right now, dear Father, that you will bless this place for being a safe haven, a sanctuary of hope, dear Father. We bless you and we love you. We thank you, God.